Hi, everybody. We will get started in just a few minutes here. We're going to let um, all of our attendees get um, get into the webinar room and um, we'll get started in about a minute, maybe two minutes. Okay, let's get started. Um, thanks everybody for coming on this beautiful fall afternoon. Um, I'm gonna get going here and share my screen. Welcome to the panel. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Meg Doerr, and I'm MACERC's Research Outreach Specialist. I am so pleased to introduce this panel on AIS success stories because it really gets to the core of why we are all here today and what MACERC is about. Whether you're a Lake Association member, a local or a state agency biologist, a student, a career researcher, or a concerned citizen, we're all here today because we know that the tools available in our toolbox are not enough and that we need innovative solutions to the problem of aquatic invasive species. Even beyond this, it's not enough for those of us in the research community to simply generate more knowledge, publish the research, and expect our work to end there. Engaging continually with the end users of our research at all stages of the process, from idea to implementation, is necessary if we expect the science to be put to use where it's most needed. Since the beginning of MACERC, our primary mission has been to bring together the brightest and hardest working scientists across multiple disciplines to, ve to develop real implementable solutions to AIS problems. But since our first showcase in 2014, the event has always focused on highlighting our researchers and updating our stakeholders on the progress of MACERC sponsored projects. Because our mission is to produce knowledge and tools that practitioners and managers can use in the fight against AIS, we thought it was time to finally share some of their stories. So our goals with this panel are to bring some positivity to the outlook in the battle against AIS, to show you how working managers are integrating research into their projects, and to show you how a research informed approach can improve results, cut down on costs, time and labor and reduce non-target impacts. We have a great trio here of outstanding local managers who have also been wonderful partners to MACERC researchers. Very little of our research would be possible without the direct collaboration and coordination of working managers. This includes helping secure permits and sharing samples, of course, but it goes way beyond that. A working partnership helps academic researchers stay grounded in real world needs and lets us know that our research outcomes are hitting the right targets. Our research is stronger because of their support and this shared knowledge broadens the impact of our science, ultimately giving us better tools in the fight against AIS. So I'm gonna introduce our three panelists. They will each provide a short presentation highlighting a recent project and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. So just note that um, as a webinar attendee, your camera and microphone will be disabled. 
but we would love to see your questions and comments in the chat or the Q&A windows. Justine Dauphiné is the Water Quality Coordinator for the Coon Creek Watershed District and has spent the last decade working on AAS-related issues. Her introduction to the field was as, as a summer job as a commercial aquatic herbicide applicator while studying environmental science at Gustavus Adolphus College. This experience led her to pursue a Master's of Science in Fisheries and Aquatic Biology at the University of Minnesota, where she studied invasive carp under Peter Sorensen. After earning her Master's, Justine was hired as a research fellow during the early days of MACERC. There, she continued her work on applied common carp research and management. Justine then accepted a position with the Metro Watershed District, where she continues to tackle water resources issues including management of local AIS populations, such as common carp, Phragmites, and hybrid water milfoil. Patrick Salter has spent the last 23 years working in all aspects of PLM Lake and Land Management Company. He currently serves as the VP of Midwest Operations and is an active corporate board member. Patrick relocated with PLM's expansion from Michigan to Northern Minnesota in 2001, and under his leadership, the company has become Minnesota's leader in the management of AIS. Most recently, he expanded the Northern Minnesota services into the Twin Cities Metro with a new facility. He's focused his career on researching science-based, environmentally friendly, and economical management methods to provide effective and long-term solutions to the growing AIS problem. He works with customers to make sound decisions while overseeing and participating in the work being done on hundreds of water bodies by his crews. Among various partnerships, Patrick is a member of the Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates, Midwest Aquatic Plant Management Society, and the North American Lake Management Society. Patrick also serves on MACERC's Center Advisory Board. Josh Maxwell is a Water Resources Coordinator for the Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek Watershed District, and he's been with the district for six years. Josh directs and manages the district's water quality monitoring program which includes the installation and maintenance of water quality equipment and the collection and analysis and reporting of data from district water body bodies and the development of water quality monitoring projects. He also implements the district's AIS management plan and that includes overseeing carp management. Josh has degrees in water resources and fisheries and biology from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Okay, Justine, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, great. Thank you, Meg. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen right now. Full screen mode. Well, except for I can't see it. Um, I guess, Meg, can you see my slides like this? Good enough? You're muted. Yes, I can see the slides, but it's not presenter view. Okay. Oh, we're going with this because that's that's what I have. So, um, That'll work. Thanks. What was that? That'll work. Okay, sorry everybody. Um, like Meg said, my name is Justine Dauphiné. I'm with the Coon Creek Watershed District um, and today I'm going to be sharing with you some of our work on applying Miserk's research um, in managing Phragmites. So uh, my kind of saga with Phragmites research all started at this very event in 2017. Um, this was my first showcase as a resource manager instead of as a, a center researcher. So it was kind of fun um, to be on the other side of the table and really expand my horizons and go to different talks on different topics other than common carp. Um, and one of those talks was by Sue Galadowicz and Julia Bonin called Phragmites, Hiding in Plain Sight. And I'll admit, I went into this as kind of a skeptic, thinking, 
Phragmites is just one of those wetland plants like cattails where there's this native version and an invasive version and you can't really tell them apart and it's everywhere and it's hopeless. But I left with kind of a completely different take home message. Um, the point of the talk was talking about Phragmites, what it is, what it isn't, that there was still a lot of unknowns in Minnesota and kind of a call to action about how you could help. Um, and I left that talk with this manila folder called the MinFrag Early Detection Kit. And it was basically calling volunteers to do kind of four simple things. Start looking for and seeing Phragmites, learn to identify the invasive from the native, to report those findings, and to take a sample and send it to the U for verification. And what I'm showing here is um, part of that kit, there was this guide to identifying native versus non-native frag. And I would highly recommend checking it out if you're interested in doing this. And there's all kinds of really high quality pictures um, comparing the subtle differences. And the one I'm showing here is something I would normally just kind of blow past and think, well, the ligule height of native is more than a millimeter and the ligule height of non-native is less than a millimeter. And I was like, what is a ligule and how is this useful? I'm never gonna be able to tell the difference. But then there was all these helpful hints in the guide and it said for the native plants, it will look like it's drawn on with a charcoal pencil. And for the non-native, it looks like it's drawn on with a ballpoint pen. And I can't tell you how accurate that is and that this has become really my favorite trait in trying to distinguish these two. Um, up in the Coon Creek Watershed District, we're in Anoka County, we have a lot of native Phragmites. Um, so it's really important that we can tell these differences. Um, so I took these kit, this kit, I kind of learned how to identify them, I trained my field staff, we have ditch inspectors and construction site inspectors, and said if you see Phragmites, grab a sample, bring it back to me. Um, and over that, that first field season, I personally found and reported eight sites within Coon Creek Watershed District, which is, you know, maybe 100 or so square miles. So I thought to myself, well, if I found eight sites, all these other hundreds of volunteers out there across the state must be finding a bunch of sites. And I was kind of back to being pessimistic and thinking, you know, Phragmites is hopeless. Um, but then I went to the 2018 Miser Showcase and I saw this talk titled Phragmites Pushback, is eradication possible? And I thought to myself, what kind of AIS researcher puts the word eradication in the title of their talk? We're not normally talking about eradication. We're talking about, you know, control to some threshold where we can kind of live with the damage. So this must be good news. Um, I'm really excited to go to this talk and hear about what all these Fragnet um, volunteers and what the staff has found. And kind of the take home message from this talk was the good. Um, although Fragmites is widespread across the strait, state, it's relatively scarce. There's a few hundred small populations scattered around. Uh, the bad news is there was really an elevated risk of spread prior to this work. Um, researchers in Minnesota weren't sure if Phragmites could actually spread um, via seed, if it was too cold up here for the seeds to be viable. And with those samples that were submitted, they found, yes, there's viable seed in the vast majority of the state. But the conclusion was really, um, there is still hope. So, um, this is kind of what that statewide picture looked like in uh, the beginning of 2019. There was 400 populations across the state, but almost 90% of them were small, less than a quarter acre. And about half of those were like really, really small, less than 500 square feet. So this is a, a manageable problem. And we have this window of opportunity in Minnesota where eradication is not only possible, but actually kind of feasible. It's cost effective, it's doable. And this call to action that the time to act is now before we end up like some of our neighbors, um, like Eastern Wisconsin and the Great Lakes or Nebraska and the Great Plains, um, where they're seeing real impacts, you know, clogged drainage ways, line of sight issues with road right of ways and just overall decreased habitat value in our, our native wetlands. So that got me thinking, okay, well, as a resource manager in Anoka County, you know, my jurisdiction is this zoomed in area of the map here. So this is right from the MinFrag website. Um, so it looks like I, the, the red dots are invasive populations and the blue dots were native populations. These were all submitted as, as part of the volunteer um, program. And it's like, well, I've got about a dozen populations in, in my watershed district. This is manageable. You know, now what do I do? 
So I turned again to, to the MACERC guidance and they had just published this handy like five page guide um, of management recommendations that was a literature review of all the work going on across the nation and it kind of boiled down to here's the plan we think will work in Minnesota. We're recommending an optional summer mow, a late season, a fall herbicide treatment, a follow up winter mow, and then kind of evaluate that and repeat as necessary. I thought, okay, well, that, that's simple enough, doable. I'll just follow this guidance and, and see where it gets me. Um, so that's where um, I ended up partnering with the Anoka Conservation District in setting out to eradicate Phragmites um, countywide in Anoka County. Um, it was really um, a strategic to partner with the Anoka Conservation District because they are a countywide entity. And I figured we don't only have Phragmites in my watershed district, but probably in the greater county as well. And then I also only had expertise dealing with aquatic herbicide, you know, um, like milfoil and curly leaf treatments. And the conservation district had a lot of experience with terrestrial noxious weeds. So we kind of combined and joined forces with Phragmites where we have both aquatic, wetland, terrestrial populations. And there's kind of different intricacies when it comes to um, permidine and the different chemicals you can use and contractors and so forth. So it was a nice pair. Um, so we set out to control 14 sites, totaling two and a half acres of infestation. Um, the conservation district published a request for proposals looking for one contractor to do all of this work. We ended up contracting with PLM Lake and Land Management. So I'm sure Patrick can answer some questions about Phragmites too at, at the end of this panel. Um, at a very, I think, competitive and reasonable price, just over $6,000. And we also reached out to Anoka County um, and applied for a cost share grant um, with the AIS prevention aid money with the state money that's passed down to the counties. Um, and they were supportive of this work and provided 50% cost share funds. Um, so it was really nice to have lo strong local support and kind of split up some of these costs and staff time. Um, so it was very manageable. So the results, um, we ended up receiving permission from all 14 landowners. This was actually the most kind of time intensive, most difficult part of this whole program, um, but we did it. Uh, we treated with Amazapir in late fall of 2019. We followed up with winter mow at eight of these sites. We didn't do all of the sites because some just didn't need it. They were small enough or sparse enough where that dead stem biomass wouldn't get in the way of, of any follow-up treatment. Um, and our control results were incredibly positive. Um, we got 77 to 100% control overall, 94% uh, control when you look at the total area infested, that two and a half acres, and then we were down to like 0.14 acre or something, 6% of that area. Um, this is just a picture showing one of our sites. It's a little hard to see. Um, but this is actually a wetland at like the Lowe's store in Coon Rapids and this whole, um, the brown area, those are dead Phragmite stems after treatment. And this summer there's one single stem um, growing up out of, of the dead stem. So this was 99% control here. I ended up just going out with a shovel and digging that one species up, uh, one stem up and we'll be back next year if, if we see any more stems and need to do a follow-up herbicide treatment. But we're well on our way to, to eradication here. Um, here's just another example. This is the shores of Sunrise Lake in Blaine. Um, you can see the before picture just how thick those stems are, 20 feet tall. You can imagine if this was your lake shore, it would certainly impede your view and your access. Um, and then after we ended up with, you know, a couple dozen stems lining the, the fringe of the storm pond in the wetland. Um, so with that winter mow, these are very easy to now target with herbicide and we're expecting to get full control after two years here. And then lastly, here's just one more site. This is our aquatic site. This is in Ham Lake, um, Ham Lake itself on the shoreline, a 2,500 square foot patch. After one, one year of herbicide and a winter mow, we cut it off at the surface of the ice. We have not seen a single live Phragmite stem. Um, so, so that's great. Um, this is obviously from winter, but I was out there last week and there's like two sprigs of cattails and that's all that's there. So very, very promising results. Um, and that brings us to kind of 2019 Mazurk Showcase, where as we were working on this kind of small Anoka County 
pilot, um, the researchers at Mazurk were working on developing strategies to, to do this statewide, statewide control. Um, and what they came up with is this really awesome report that I would encourage you to check out on their website where they broke the state into regions and then they zoomed in on every region. So I've got the metro here and went through how many populations, where are they, what kind of equipment would it take to manage it, what approximately would that cost over a three year period towards eradication. And I pulled out what they had for Anoka County. They said it would cost between $5,500 and $9,000 to eradicate Phragmites. Um, so comparing that to our actual cost of doing this exact work, um, really right, right in, on the money. Um, we, that first year cost just over $6,000. This year we have very minimal follow-up um, treatment at a few hundred dollars. So we're looking at six, $7,000 plus staff time basically to eradicate um, Phragmites from Anoka County. I'm sure there'll be another few hundred dollars the next year. Um, but like I said before, when you split this between some local partners, um, it's very, very doable. And it's nice to have that report to show to your board of managers or your decision makers, you know, to say that in this three year period, this minor investment goes a long way towards this coordinated statewide effort of solving this, this larger problem. Um, so I guess that's all I have. And I just wanted to end with a, a shout out to the minfrag.org website where you can find all the resources I mentioned in this talk to start your own uh, Phragmites control journey, or there's my email address if you want to talk to me directly. Um, so back to you, Meg. All right. Thank you so much, Justine. Um, yeah, that is a really cool, inspiring story to just hear how you know, you got your eyes were opened uh, from going to a showcase talk and then you just took it from, you know, within your own sphere of influence at the watershed district and how that's turned into a, you know, a county, you know, metro wide multi county effort. And um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but make, noting that the metro area was one of the worst spots in the whole state for FRAG. So, I mean, the, the difference that, that you have made and getting others to take up arms against FRAG has been a real game changer. And um, I loved your photo too of the single FRAG stock. <laughs> That's great. So, okay, um, we'll go to Patrick next. My screen sharing. There we go. That looks there good. Go. Good. I apologize. I'm doing it remotely via remotely. So um, we'll see how this works. Uh, my name is Patrick, and one of the um, talks that are things that we have been working with um, is is with Ray Newman and his team on hybrid milfoil. And in uh, 2015, um, Ray began a process to identify various uh, hybrids. So they found evidence that the, the hybrid was, was more vigorous um, and could take a huge advantage over uh, Eurasian water milfoil. And we were a little bit concerned that as we started managing Eurasian water milfoil that we would be contributing to uh, in, um, speeding up the process of hybridization in the lakes. Um, and so they uh, found that uh, around the state that there was many, many different hybrid genotypes or various where they're taking various traits from both the parent uh, Eurasian water milfoil and our native milfoil. So um, one thing we did know prior to this was that hybrid milfoil demonstrates tolerances to certain herbicides at certain label rates, which is of concern as well. And then uh, when we, when we genotype various hybrid populations, we can allow for a very more adaptive control strategy. So one of the projects that we have been working with is um, North Arm Bay in Lake Minnetonka. And in 2014, um, we identified almost the entire littoral area was dominated by, at that time, we just called it Eurasian water milfoil. And in 2014, we treated the entire areas with a product called, uh, with a liquid version of liquid 2,4-D. And we 
realized that we did a really a great job of eliminating Eurasian water milfoil. Um, so on the left, you can see um, we still had quite a bit of milfoil in there, but most of it was coming back as hybrid. And there is a certain species, um, I like to call it HA, it's eight, it's my enemy. It's a hybrid that no matter what we were doing in North Arm, it just seemed to be persistent. So in 2015, you can see that we had several different types. There was still some Eurasian, um, but we had a lot of hybrid milfoil showing up. And not only did we have a lot of hybrid, we had several different genotypes showing up. And 2015, we became very, very alarmed that after treatment, we were forcing hybridization throughout North Arm Bay. And we decided that we needed to kind of change some chemistry. So in 2015, we changed to a different product, a triclopyr based product. And again, you could see we were really effective where we treated, but we still had this H8 population persisting through our treatment sites in some of them. And we weren't making a ton of progress on the hybrids, but we've all but eliminated Eurasian by the end of 2015. This was a lot of uh, pretty concerning because we don't want to force on a, uh, a rapid hybridization. And so at the end of 2015, um, in 2016, we did some minimal treatments and can, um, allowed Ray and his team to continue collecting their data as we knew we needed to change uh, our treatment strategy to manage this, these variant hybrids that weren't being really impacted by our, our treatments. Um, here's just another zoomed in. <clears throat> and, um, 2000, so in 2018, we decided that um, you can see uh, we took a couple years off of just doing some very small isolated treatments while we collected more data, uh, the, the various hybrids, and we proposed that we would treat the entire bay with fluoridone at a very low rate. Um, in this instance, our treatment program was uh, exposing the milfoil to uh, about a four part per million concentration of fluoridone for the entire summer. So about 90 days is what we exposed and maintained rates for, all because we were not getting the levels of control via our previous treatments. Uh, so uh, in here, you can see that in May, there was quite a bit of milfoil had rebounded, and that was only two years after we had conducted our first few treatments out there and most all of that was hybrid and various types of hybrid. Our post-treatment in August, they found one plant um, out of all of the entire bay. So we knew we were being extremely effective and that we had found the right tool for the hybrid milfoil in North Arm Bay. And so I'm just gonna leave that with a special thanks. I know it was short and sweet, but uh, I, tend to give long lengthy scientific based. So today was a good example just to kind of highlight a project that we're working on with um, both um, with, with the university. Uh, and our ultimate goal for this process is to use the, the data and the information collected from Ray and his team and start making and building a database where we can sample plants from lakes or especially hybrid milfoil and quickly identify the best treatment strategy, which, you know, which populations are tolerant to certain herbicides and which population are not. And we can develop a very quick and, and effective strategy without having to go through three or four years like we did on North Arm Bay, we would be able to identify the best treatment strategy right off the, the get-go. So we are excited that uh, Ray is continuously working on this this summer and we will have a lot more data coming in at the end of summer and this is just one of many many of the lakes that his team has been working with us on and one of many projects that we feel the importance of identifying these these genotypes will help determine how we move forward with hybrid milfoil management. So with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Patrick.
Yeah, that's, um, that's a, I'm glad you brought up the database. That's a great um, example um, of how research, like there's no way that one research team would be able to kind of conduct these in-water treatments all around the state where we have hybrid milfoil populations. And so having that framework of data sharing and the feedback loop between researchers and applicators such as yourself is really going to help us move that ball forward. And anybody on this call that if you weren't able to catch um, Dr. Ryan Dooms and um, Dr. Newman's uh, talk yesterday, um, those will be recorded and available. And Ryan goes into a lot more detail about the database that Patrick mentioned. So more to come there. And um, Josh, we'll tee you up. All right. Thanks, Meg. All right. I'm going to talk about kind of a case study in common cart management and just wanted to highlight that we worked with uh, both Dr. Peter Sorensen and Dr. Pizemnik Bayer. And Peter Sorensen has kind of developed the game plan to attack common cart uh, and attack their life history in order to be able to control it. Um, and with the Watershed District and University of Minnesota we were able to kind of tackle this problem. And Prozemic uh, has taken a lot of the research and adapted it to fit a, a different type of removal strategies and also you know, just trying to attack every life history, uh, all the life history of carp to try and get them under control. So I'm just gonna quickly wire carp and carp bad news. They're long lived, they live a long time. They get big fast so predators can't take advantage of them. Uh, for very long. They, large females, like the one pictured, uh, can produce millions of eggs a year, so they're very prolific. And they can migrate uh, hundreds of miles. They're very intelligent. They have a great taste of smell, taste, hearing, and they're really disruptive to native uh, ecosystems. And this uh, little infographic was taken from Peter Sorensen, um, and it kind of highlights all the different things that are going on with carp in a, in a lake system. So carp, what they like to do is root around on the bottom and eat all kinds of uh, nice stuff on the bottom of the lake. While they're doing that, they're re-suspending sediment and with sediment, there are nutrients. And while they're also uprooting uh, plants, and so plants, the amount of plants in a lake are great, can be greatly reduced. And then along with, uh, if you have a large number of carp, the excrement adds up. It all adds up. Less plants, really gross water, algae blooms, basically kind of mud hole lakes is the, is the, is the outcome if carp can get, get out of control. So I'm gonna talk specifically about Starring Lake and the Purgatory, Purgatory Creek Recreation Area. The Starring Lake is south and then the Purgatory Rec area is on the north, and they're connected by Purgatory Creek. So what happens um, is working with the university, they tagged fish, and they, fi they found out that carp from Starring Lake travel up into the rec area, and then they spawn in there. And they try and go up every year, and a lot of, a lot of years, winter kills happen. But with the, that one time where a winter kill doesn't happen, the carp are still moving up into the rec area. And that's when you get these huge events of uh, recruitment. So carp basically ha have free range up in the upper rec area and they, they have a lot of really high uh, recruitment years. So lots of babies. So working with the University of Minnesota, like I said, we tagged fish and we kind of used, you know, that targeting life history for control. So one of the steps we did was put in place a barrier between, in Purgatory Creek, between the rec area and Starring Lake. So what this would do is it prevents fish from moving up into the rec area. So we can kind of force fish to stay in Starring uh, because they do not have successful recruitment events in Starring because the predation of bluegills, which is pictured in the middle, uh, there's enough bluegills to keep the common carp under control. They essentially eat carp eggs and larval carp. So, um, Preventing them from getting up into the rec area would prevent them from spawning. 
The other, the other uh, way you can do this is let the carp go on up into the wreck area, shut the door behind them, and then hope for a winter kill. And then what the district has been utilizing as of late is when these fish are moving up and when they're moving back down, we can actually use that as our advantage with the barrier uh, and remove fish when they're trying to, when they're congregating at that barrier. So we've been using a barrier. We've also stocked bluegills into the wreck area and Starring Lake just to make sure that we have good populations established. And so they can kind of keep carp under control. Um, and then the, the best way that in the Starring Lake system that we had for control of carp is doing winter removals with uh, commercial fishermen. So again, those tagged fish, what, in the winter time, what carp like to do is they like to aggregate together and group up in the deeper areas of the lake. And then using telemetry equipment, we can find out where everyone's hanging out and they'll group up and then you can, uh, commercial fishermen can come out and say, the carp are right here. Uh, the, the example in the background there, that, that's Lake Riley. You can see they formed a very tight aggregation and we were able to remove a lot of fish. So, um, but like I said, carp are intelligent. So uh, what we found in starring is they actually started to learn to avoid the nets in, the, in that first time you did it in the winter when their aggregating was our best. But then on the bottom, I just wanted to throw the, the carp biomass, so where it was and then where it is now using kind of these removal techniques and um, stocking of bluegills. So at the beginning of the project, we were up close to 500 kilograms per hectare. That doesn't uh, necessarily do any value to you, but that line going across my graph is the 100 kilograms per hectare. So that was, uh, as part of the project the U of M was working on, Peter Sorensen, uh, they developed that, uh, basically that threshold. If you have carp under that threshold, so that biomass under 100 kilograms per hectare, then you're, they're not gonna have a, a, a very noticeable effect on your lake. So, as you can see, all these removal efforts, specifically the winter seining, we are, we are now um, at about 50 kilograms per hectare, so well below our threshold that we, uh, that we wanted to be at. So now I'm gonna kind of go through uh, the different things that we've noticed in Starring Lake. So uh, we work with, also work with Ray Newman and Patrick, uh, so uh, doing plant herbicide treatments and plant uh, just point intercept surveys. So basically I put up kind of two years just to show kind of the, the differences. So in 2011 is kind of the beginning year of our project. And in 2012 to 2014, those were our main removal years. So I just kind of before or after um, what we've seen. So, so in 2011, total plant coverage was less than 15%. And in 2016, it was greater than 50%. So just a massive shift in vegetation alone. And then if you, if you guys look at over to the right, I have put up the heat maps. This is also from Ray Newman's data. Um, so June 2013, you can really see the, the red is basically plant biomass from the bottom of the lake to the top of the lake. Um, there isn't much in 2013, but in 2019, it's actually greater than 60% coverage on the lake. So just a massive plant shift, community shift. So, And then in 2011, there was four species of plants. And our highest year was 2000, 2016, where we had 11 different species of plants. And uh, we kind of bounced around that eight, seven, seven eight uh, species. So but 2016, we saw the most uh, variety of plants. And then overall plant depth, so they, the, how deep plants can grow. In 2011, it was 1.4 meters. And then in 2016, it was 3.3. So obviously the plants have expanded uh, greatly into the lake. And then I just wanted to quick point out the water quality improvements. So again, in that box is kind of the main target years of removal. And so at the top is Secchi disc. So that's that little disc that you drop into the water and you can measure water clarity. And uh, so you, in, in that, the lines in these graphs are the MPCA water quality standards. And these are essentially the averages across the growing season for each year. And so I just wanted to point out that 
below the line for Secchi disk is where we want to be. We want the most maximum depth. Um, so this goes along with the plants because if you have more water clarity, you have more plants uh, and ability for plants to grow in deeper water. So you can really see the, the differences that pre and post and comparing four years pre and, and four years post, we had about a half meter increase in Secchi disk. And then going on the bottom there, so this is kind of flipped. We want to be below the, the MPCA standard of 0 0.06 milligrams per liter. And just overall, we saw a 35% reduction comparing four years pre and four years post uh, carp removal. So you can see, I mean, a successful carp strategy. This system is, is smaller, easy to kind of easier to control. You're never going to eliminate all the carp, but you can see very significant impacts in a lake. Um, yeah, and then with that, I guess I'll turn it over to Meg. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, one quick question for you, Josh. So you mentioned that one of the lakes that started out with, I think you said 500 kilogram, kil kilograms per hectare carp biomass. Yep. For, for folks, maybe if, um, attendees who haven't spent a lot of time on lakes with severe carp infestations, can you just give a little context of, of what, what that might feel like or look like on the water, that kind yes. of carp biomass? Yeah, so um, that was part of a, a mark recapture that the University of Minnesota did. And that was around 26, 27,000 fish. And Starring Lake is not a very big lake. It's about 164 acre lake. So that's, that's a lot of fish for that size of a lake. And in, in talking with uh, residents in the area, I mean, it was basically no vegetation. They couldn't go out and catch anything. Um, just muddy water, algae blooms, kind of just a, what you what you think of when you think of kind of a gross lake. <laughs> so mm -hmm. We've seen yeah. some pretty significant improvements. So. Okay, uh, we, we have a question here from Nick. Uh, to, it looks like it's also to Josh. Um, what what did the plant community do in the lake after the carp were, or what was the plant community after the carp were removed? Um, was it native or invasive? Can you just talk a little bit about the species? Yep. That yeah, came that's, back? that's that's a really great question. Obviously, if you just had a bunch of <laughs> Eurasian water milfoil, that would be bad. Um, so we did have, um, it's funny enough, we had uh, water clear up to the point where we actually noticed brittle naiad, which is a, a different aquatic plant. Um, it's fairly new to the metro area. Um, it's actually very robust and dense population in the upper rec area. And we actually found plants once the water cleared up a little bit more, um, established themselves. But as of right now, the brutal naiad isn't out of control. It's, it's very, very low density. And then in 2016, we had Eurasian water milfoil get introduced to the lake. Um, but uh, only two, two invasive species of plants in the lake. And um, yeah, there's a lot of different variety of species. Coontail is, is a dominant species. So. Okay, great. Um, so that, um, that wraps up our uh, presentation. So folks, if you want to ask questions, please, um, you can put that into the chat or the Q&A box. Um, I have a question for the group while, while folks start entering their thoughts. Um, I want to know a little bit about the process of sort of deciding to engage with research. Um, a lot of times when you're working, you know, you're in the thick of it, you're working for an agency. So many decisions I feel like are sort of driven by inertia and just the way it's always been done. And um, if you have new information, you want to take a new approach, sometimes you have to overcome some resistance, especially if it is a, a new, a more innovative, maybe even un, unproven approach as, as happens when you're working with researchers. So I wanted to know if you had encountered resistance from your supervisors, county board, upper management, whomever, um, and, and how you worked through that. Maybe we'll start with you, Justine, if you encountered anything. Sure. Um, well, coming from the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center as staff, 
to um, more of a local management position, I think it's kind of a natural transition for me to kind of still keep keep one foot in, in the U of M and keep tabs on that research and try to apply it as much as possible in my work. And I think with the Fragmites research, the price tag was was so small. I mean, when you're talking $3,000, I didn't have a lot of opposition, but if it were to, you know, $100,000 carp research problem, I project I probably would have. Um, but I think really looking at kind of the, it as an investment, like a short term, small investment for the long term game, game um, benefit and like trying to quantify what the monetary impact could be if you did nothing um, is a strategy we look at in, in a lot of the things that you know we're trying to um, get get permission from our board and county board for. Yeah, definitely. Patrick, how about you? What what has that been like working um, in a, a private business? Well in the private sector um, it can be tough getting um, buy-in. Um, we try to stay innovative. I think uh, a lot of what we do um, in the private sector really reflects this collaboration between people such as Justine and the U um, and, and integrating it all. Um, our, at the core of our company has always been research. It's driven mostly by my passion to, to research and find um, better methods. Uh, now occasionally we can come into, you know, when you have a project online and you're really wanting to do something and you have to make it really more economical to do this, um, do these, these research projects. An example would be the early days of zebra muscle control. Um, it, we, we would, you know, upper management would see our numbers and say, what are you doing? You're not making any money. But <laughs> the result of that is, is that we have some tools now for, um, um, you know, early detection, rapid response that we didn't have, and it can justify those those costs and, and that. Um, but some of the other, you know, one of the one of the biggest coolest things that that we are seeing right now is these collabor collaborations between everybody, the DNR, the watersheds, the university, where we're all working together with the same goal, and we're putting instead of just one set of eyes on it, we're putting five or six eyes on it which makes a huge difference. And then with you know, the advancement of technologies and in these um, GIS softwares, we can really, really communicate effectively from the field. Um, so if uh, you know, I'm working on a project and Ray needs to know something, I usually can get him an answer right from the field where I don't have to wait to go back to my office. Yeah, that's great. Um, we do have one question in so far um, from Nancy. I guess Justine or Josh could probably field this one. Can you talk about how you actually measure a carp population in a given water body? Yeah, so the abundance can be uh, measured basically in a mark recapture study. Um, and then from that, the U University of Minnesota developed a, a basically an equation that you can electrofish for so long and then kind of plug it into your equation and figure out kind of a general idea. Obviously a mark recapture study um, would be more accurate. Um, so basically you would capture a whole bunch of fish, tag them, mark them somehow, and then go out with a different type of gear and try and cap cap capture them again and then see how many you, you get. And then from there you can calculate how many carp are in a lake. And then the, the electrofishing surveys are just a little, uh, way more abbreviated, way less time consuming. <laughs> so yeah, those are kind of the two main ways. So. Okay, yeah. Um, we have a good question in from Kristen. Um, how did some of these partnerships come together? Uh, can you talk about ways that you might start up a partnership with a researcher? Yeah, I can, I can go first, I guess. Um, so our board was really supportive of some type of carp management. We knew carp were a problem and um, they uh, basically got together with the U and the U presented their ideas. And now a, a lot of people have taken that, like I said, kind of that game plan of attacking life history of common carp and 
a lot of other watershed districts have utilized some of the research. So it's really cool to see. Yes. I can go. Um, I think the, uh, you know, most of these partnerships, I think, are formed over a cup of coffee at the showcase most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. A lot of times you're sitting there having talking to somebody and it's you're talking to somebody and then the next person to you is like, hey, I overheard you. And it's like, yeah. So um, I, I think the, the showcase has been instrumental in getting people connected with the right people. The university has done a great job of, oh, that's a field that you should go over to Ray or directing people to where they need to get to. Um, and, and a lot of those partnerships are kind of formed like I said, right there at the showcase. That's great. Yeah, I, I agree with that, um, with, with the Fragmites work. Like I said in my presentation, I went to this Fragmites talk at the 2017 showcase, and then I went up, I had never met Julia Bonin and shook her hand and she gave me her card and was like, oh, if you wanna do management, let's do this. Like, let me, let me know. And we just had just kind of casual conversations and emails kind of translated into this beneficial um, partnership. So, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> I like that that segue a little bit. So that's one thing that, um, as the MaySearch staff, we really grappled with that because we know that that is such a critical um, element of the showcases. Those just those interactions that happen in the hallway and at lunch and afterwards, and it's very difficult to have those kinds of connections in a virtual showcase. So. I hope everybody got the message about the virtual happy hours starting up um, after this panel ends. So that's just gonna be unstructured time to meet with your peers, different stakeholder groups and talk about ideas and potential collaborations and um, share ideas that maybe were sparked from a presentation you saw. So that's the time we have um, for that uh, after this panel. Um, for, for watershed district folks, um, so we have this huge body of literature and knowledge now based on the uh, life history of invasive common carp in Minnesota now. And you know, so much of that work has been done in the Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek watershed district. But I'm curious, you know, as you're trying to implement these ideas and some of this knowledge in a place that was outside of the study area, maybe for you, Justine. Can you talk about like the tools that you have and how you, how you, how you take research that's been done elsewhere, and and apply that to your project area? I mean, you definitely have a leg up being a a carp researcher before you came to the watershed district. But I'm kind of I'd like to learn more about how working managers take stuff that's in the scientific literature and apply that to their own projects. Yeah, I guess I would say a lot of working managers are not turning to the scientific literature. Um, I mean, I'm probably an exception to that because I'm really tuned in with the primary research, but, but watershed folks in particular, um, we look, you know, like, it's like, oh, if Riley Purgatory will partner with the U and, and do this study, and kind of work out the kinks and then we can talk with them and and then use that information two years later and like Ramsey Washington and um, was also right up there in the beginning with the carp game and then when I worked at the center it was I was working for Minnehaha Creek applying what we learned in Ramsey Washington and Riley Perg out there and it just kind of continues to grow that way and I think um, all of us managers um, have a pretty decent relationship and line of communication uh, on things like this and other like water quality projects and issues and we have a, like a conference called MOD, um, the Minnesota Association of Watershed Districts, where it's essentially kind of this this same type of format where people give like a 10 minute spiel on, on what's working for them and we have a lot of informal you know conversations over beer and coffee and and learn from each other but it's it's nice when um, that initial investment in kind of jumping in on the cutting edge like someone needs to do that so if we can kind of spread that around the metro and I'll do Fragmites you do carp someone else do you know hybrid milfoil so we can have one big investment and then I'll, I'll learn from that more cost effective so I don't know that's kind of my take as a as a manager and kind of seeing what it's like as part of this this world yeah 
Yeah. Yeah, just Did a follow-up. Chime in on that, yeah. Yeah, just a follow-up with Justine, yeah. I mean, I completely agree with kind of building this uh, basically group of knowledge. I've, I've helped out, a, you know, a number of watershed districts. They've had questions, or Carver County, um, just about the different management techniques. What didn't work is just as important at what, as what did work. Definitely. So, just learning from each other is is a huge thing and everyone needs to do it because otherwise none of these things will get under control if we can't work together kind of push us in the right direction so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Patrick do you have anything you want to add on on this topic <laughs> yeah I think um, the the I mean the the collaboration that we get um, a lot of times in the field. Um, I'll be working and with Carver County and I know Justine might have something going on up in Anoka County. I, I can be like, hey, you got to get a hold of her because she's doing this. And it, it really gets everybody tied in. And I think over my career, almost all of our most successful projects have been a collaboration between the researchers, the regulatory agencies, the watershed districts, and, and sometimes you'd be sitting in a, in a room and it's, you're looking around and this is a huge group. How are we all going to manage each other's feelings on when, when the topic of herbicide comes up or whatever? But most of the time what I find is when we're working together, even though we might have different ideas on how to get to a common goal, we seem to be able to hash things out pretty fast and pretty effectively, um, especially when you've only got three months to get your work done. We have a long winter where we can all sit and talk about things. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Um, let's see, we had a question coming in from Tegan Ward um, and they write, so Minnesota is unique to have MACERC and, and the grant funding available at the county level to support AIS research and partnerships at the, at the local level. And um, just if anybody's listening and aren't aware, so the, the state of Minnesota administers um, prevention funding to each county and the amount that's allocated is based on basically the, the water resources and the formula that they use looks at the boat launches and number of parking spaces to then allocate money to county governments to run an inspection program. So that's the background there. And it's, it's pretty unique to Minnesota. Um, and so Tegan asks, what advice do you have for local resource managers in other states that might not have access to similar networks, funding, or resources? I guess I, I can start. Um, I think we are unique with that, that county prevention aid funding, um, although that is a, a relatively small pot of money once you get down to the local level and there's a lot of dedicated uses for it already. Um, so I guess one strategy that I would recommend is, you know, don't just manage AIS to manage AIS, manage it for the reason. If it's for water quality improvement, then look for water quality improvement opportunities, um, especially in, in the carp world. If you have impaired lakes under the Federal Clean Water Act that aren't meeting phosphorus standards and carp is a big reason why you can't get there, um, then that opens up a lot more pots of money, Federal 319 funding for non-point source solution, um, other like, well, state of Minnesota clean, um, clean water funds. Um, so I guess really look at why you're trying to manage AIS. Is it for recreation? Is it for habitat? Is it for water quality? And look at available grants um, supporting those things. I think that's a really good point. I, I feel like, you know, as AIS managers and people studying it, we all have different motivations and, you know, uh, so me personally, I just really care about native plants and animals. Uh, I'm not personally an angler, but I have that in common with someone who is a diehard walleye fisherman. Um, we should both care about AIS because AIS are going to make potentially the walleye that they eat have higher mercury and they're going to be much less abundant. 
Whereas, you know, I have a different motivation, but that's about finding that common ground and um, trying to pull resources together to, to improve our tools. Um, what are some of the big opportunities that you guys see coming in the future? Big questions or big opportunities? I guess I have some um, pretty tangible next steps, so I can at least just share that for the Fragmites work. Um, so building on the success of our Anoka County AIS pilot, um, a bunch of local resource managers were interested in that work and how's it going. And, and we got together one day, Ramsey County hosted an event and we sat around a big table. Um, we had people from, I think, eight different counties. We had the Minnesota Department of Ag there. We had Julia Bonin from the U of M, um, a couple people from Minnesota DNR said, okay, how can we scale this up and do this maybe metro wide? And I think that the metro, um, we have the biggest problem. We also have the most money. So if we can make it work here, then we can make it work outstate. Um, and so kind of on that end, we applied to the Minnesota Department of Ag for a noxious species control grant and they funded um, $49,700. Um, and my colleague, Carrie Taylor, up in Anoka County at the Conservation District, um, she signed up, she was willing, she applied for that grant, was awarded that, and um, she is kind of the, the contact organizing Metro-wide Phragmites control. Like right now, this week, um, Patrick um, PLM was awarded um, the contract, and they're out there controlling, I think it's 58, 58 sites, over six acres of Phragmites in five different counties. Um, so we've really like multiplied that Anoka County project times five. And um, we have two years of dedicated funding for that. So, I mean, we're only growing from there. Um, so we're really excited just to kind of start small and expand the scope. Yeah, cool. Anybody else yeah. want to talk about some things on the horizon, challenges and opportunities? Yeah, um, just focusing on carp management. I mean, we've been kind of looking into some of the other techniques and things that we've learned to remove uh, common carp um, and kind of, you know, accelerating that, keeping carp under control, because there's always that possibility of carp, you know, popping back up, having let that one big boom year, and then you're uh, having that same issues that you've been dealing with. So. Um, carrying that through, but then also, you know, working with uh, just managing the lake, some of the uh, external sources to kind of reduce uh, the phosphorus and chlorophyll levels in the lake. Um, but kind of that first step in Starring Lake, because carp were such a massive issue, they essentially were the problem, the majority of the problem. Mm -hmm. Once you get that under control, you can start focusing on some of these other, um, you know, inputs to the lake and you know, kind of get to those MPCA thresholds, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and jo Josh, do you feel like you have the resources to carry out that the long-term kind of the maintenance management of a small but ever-present carp population until, we, until an eradication tool is available? Yeah, I mean, as of now, I feel like uh, we're set up pretty good for you know, that maintenance control is what I call it, maintenance control. So, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, going back to the, the science communications questions um, and accessibility of research to working managers such as yourself, um, what, what I wanted to know is if you had ideas for how how we can improve that situation. It's been recognized as an issue for um, a long time that we can't just publish our stuff and put it on a library shelf and expect that people are gonna read it, internalize it, implement it. Um, and I know MACERC, this is core to our mission and we're working really hard to be accessible and make those connections, but I'm sure there's more that could always be done. Um, so what kind of materials have been helpful for you? What would you like to see more of? And um, you also have your own science communication needs to share 
you have to inform your own stakeholders about your choices and what you're doing. And um, I think we'd all just love to hear what, if your needs are being met, um, if you have ideas for areas of improvement, that would be great to know too. Yeah, com communication is always a challenge, making sure that everybody knows what's happening, what's going on, you know, where their dollars are going is very important. So, um, you know, we try and obviously presentations like this and working with MACER uh, obviously gets the word out. Um, but, you know, just at our local board meetings, you know, presenting our findings, um, all, all the MACER uh, research and you know, Peter Sorensen, um, just the university as a whole is a good source of information and just word of mouth, kind of like we had talked about, you know, earlier, building on what was successful and what wasn't successful uh, just within the, the group here, uh, uh, specifically in the metro area of watershed districts and stuff like that. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, um, one of the things is, you know, let's take 2020 off the table because we can't hold conferences, <laughs> but, um, you know, getting these, these white papers and these fact sheets that are starting to, we're starting to build into the various groups, the, 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 the Lake Association conventions, the, 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 the local units of governments when they do their, you know, annual stuff, um, I think uh, getting that information to them through all these various channels and through the people that already know is probably going to be really helpful to get this research out to the people actually in the field and managing these, these things. It's really hard when we're doing a lot of research in the seven county metro area to get information all the way up to Hibbing and, and some of those out state um, area. So utilizing the, the various networks and the, the groups, there's, there's MOD, there's a whole bunch of other groups that, you know, if we can get this information out to them, I think it will help get it to the people that need it the most. And um, there's, you know, uh, obviously there's a whole public works sector for FRAG that, you know, if they know, they might not mow. <laughs> um, kind of funny, but um, you know, if they know what to look for, it, I think it's just a matter of using all these this various networks with, with, with the fact sheets, the webinars, the workshops, uh, even demonstrating, um, showing this that one piece of frag standing there is an excellent tool to show people that you know, the research works. Yep. Um, science is, possible. is, is yep. working really well for us. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, and, and I agree with that. And I think specifically um, things that, that MACERC has been doing um, the, the webinar series, um, I think that's a great tool where it's not, you know, one full day or three full afternoons showcase, but you can just tune in every couple weeks for an hour and the really interactive um, Q&A sessions with that research. You know, it's, it's, it's like a virtual, you know, having a coffee together. I feel like there's been like I feel like dozens and dozens of questions at every seminar where you run out of time and can't answer and then publish like three pages of question and answer. So I think those are super helpful um, as well as like maybe not so much white papers, but like guidance documents like SOPs, protocol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can take and say for Fragmites, Mazur did all the legwork reviewing all the literature they said this is what we should do in Minnesota and I know it's super simplified and there's so many options you could do but for me to have that approach that says a fall herbicide treatment in a winter mow that's what Miserk recommends so following this guidelines and it's a concrete thing that my board can vote on and say yes instead of you know me trying to pull together what approach I'm going to take to management so as many simplified guides and SOPs as possible for all these topics is, is super helpful, something you can just adopt. Yeah, yep, that's great. Yeah, I think it's a good point. You kind of need, you, you need tools from that whole range, you know, from the peer reviewed literature that you can cite in your grant application. And then you need like a brochure to give to someone on the county board who has to make a decision about that along with 18 other things that night. 
And then you need something that you can hand out to the landowner to understand why it's important that they allow you to spray the frag on their land. So yeah, very true. We need the whole range. And Patrick, I think you made a really good point about um, difficulty of reaching folks from outside the metro area. And I guess that's one potential bright spot of the pandemic. We've all built up our skill set, um, despite difficulty sometimes. We've, we've built up our skill set doing these remote webinar type sessions and the AIS detectors webinars have been massively popular. We've got a great turnout for the showcase. So hopefully that work, you know, can still continue even, even when we can meet in, in person again and we can use those tools to reach folks that we don't always um, out in the metro. Um, we did get one, so this is from a comment just from Doug Jensen with C Grant. Going back to the question of um, folks that don't have a Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center to work with, um, Doug says that local managers in other states can contact their state AIS coordinators. Every state should have that. And their states are also members of regional panels that will leverage resources. So um, Doug, maybe if you want to put a, a link to a directory of those AIS coordinators, if you want to put that into the chat, uh, that would be great for our audience. Um, we have a question coming in from Nick. Uh, how do you how do you and your stakeholders balance the trade-offs between controlling AIS and protecting the environment from non-target impacts? Patrick, do you want to take that? Because you're you're doing a lot of herbicide applications, and those yeah. are um, can be controversial. So, oh, yeah, a lot of the work we we do um, is is fairly controversial, um, especially when you look at a, a picture that was shown with one stem of Phragmites and brown everywhere else. Uh, mm -hmm. What what typically is 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 really hard, and what we're learning is that when we use the research and when we reuse all of our resources, there's a risk benefit to the, you know, that's the trade-off. Are we risk, you know, can we risk a, a, a lot or a little to gain a lot? Um, and as we hone in on, on, on various parts of, of, of plant life or fish life or their aspects and really target the best time, um, you know, there's there's value to um, you know the, that trade off. What it's it's a it's a hard issue to 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 get over. Um, explaining mm -hmm. to somebody that it's going to look brown, um, but on a lot of those sites in the next year or two, you'll actually start seeing some of the native cattails. Um, I was out on one site the other day that had arrowhead coming up. Uh, it's just going to take time. So understanding the longevity of, of these non-target impacts and you know is the risk is the risk uh, is the benefit outweigh the risk um, and I think that in a lot of these projects when you can definitively answer yes to that question um, it makes it a lot easier for for people to say yes let's do this um, if there's uncertainties or things that you can't predict, it's best to have those up front and on the table so that people can make a decision based off of that, that benefit versus you know, we're well aware that, you know, something might in, in this arena might not work out. Um, in, in, in the case of North, North, North Arm Bay, you know, we're throwing a lot of different tools at it. And when you start throwing that many tools, you can certainly disrupt the native plant community. Uh, fortunately, we um, knew that going into it and we had some other projects behind us that allowed for us to say with certainty that, yeah, it's gonna take some time to recover. So it's, it's all about managing um, those, those fears and, and those you know, uncertainties but I think at the end of the day, the, the biggest um, 
challenge is saying, hey, you know, it's going to look ugly before it gets better. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, a lot of people understand that. Uh, where we fail sometimes is we don't follow up. So we, we go out, we do a project, and we get to a certain point where we have eradicated something, but you're still not seeing sites or, or things come back, or you're not seeing non-target target plants come back that is um, really a, a, a challenge to can tell people, well, we got to go plant some stuff there. You know, our, our, the, 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 we're going to have to help it along. We can't just go out and spray something. We have to help it along. And I think we'll probably start seeing that with some of these Craig Mighty sites is we're going to have to go out there and put something in the ground. Um, that frag was there for so long that nothing there is viable. The biomass of the frag is still so thick that nothing's going to want to come up through it. So, you know, managing yeah. that trade-off is really hard. Managing expectations. Yeah. Very important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else um, have anything to add on that? Yeah, I guess with carp management, there, you know, most native species, uh, there's very limited impact on uh, native fish and turtle species. Um, and just the benefit from the reduction of carp kind of um, really outweighs that very limited, you know, mortality you get um, overall. So just the, the overall benefit is, is uh, you can explain that to be worth a, a very small target, a non-target you know, mortality that you get, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna, to chime in. I, I agree with what you both said. And when it comes to like those pictures I showed of the Phragmite and just dead stems, I guess the benefit of working in an urban watershed, most of those sites are like in the middle of Coon Rapids. They're already like super disturbed, degraded wetlands. You know, we don't have much to lose. On one end, but we're also um, very receptive to to perception. Um, and like the the second picture I showed on Sunrise Lake in Blaine, where there was a dozen stems left, that HOA that owns that land actually said, you know, no, we're not going to let you treat there. We don't want just like dead Phragmite stems unless you'll do revegetation. And we've worked that into our grant with the Minnesota Department of Ag. We actually have funding or revegetating that site with native plants as kind of a demonstration of, you know, two years after using a and killing everything, and then what is it going to take to get native plants established there? So, so we are thinking about those things, but, you know, you can't do that everywhere, case by case. There's some places that are so degraded that, that the treatment isn't really any worse than, than what's there already. So... It's definitely a communications and managing expectations challenge. I think, I think thinking about invasive species control in general, we're all just so beaten down with, it feels endless and like the battle, you know, the hill gets steeper every day. And when you do have success as we're seeing with FRAG and some of the milfoil projects, you're like, whoa, I'm not prepared to talk about what would happen if we actually succeed. And I think most, a lot of people don't, don't, um, they're not thinking that it might actually work. So it's, it's just another communication challenge, but it's a great problem to have. Um, we're almost out of time. So I'll, I'll have, we'll ask one last question. Um, if there was one research gap you could fill tomorrow or next year in the future, what would it be? <laughs> While you're thinking about that, I'll put in a plug for our research needs assessment. Um, hopefully anybody listening, you've gotten an um, email about this. It's a public online survey that we do every two years to help us shape um, to find the knowledge gaps and shape our research priorities for the next um, call for proposals that will be MACERC funded projects. So it actually closes tomorrow on Friday. Um, maybe Corey or Nick could drop a link into the chat. Um, it takes five minutes, it's open to everybody and you can share your thoughts with us. We would love to hear what species and ideas you have. So who's ready to go? 
What's your one research question? All right, go ahead. All right, I'm going to go before any of you to take mine. Uh, <laughs> my, my one, the biggest gap right now, I think, is quantifying economic impacts, like locally Minnesota examples of like real impacts to things like property values or infrastructure. And then along with um, quantified, I guess, control costs. Um, like what does it take to remove a pound of phosphorus when controlling, you know, through CARP or through curly yeah. leaf management. Um, if we can get some, some kind of dollar ranges, um, that information is so useful when, when trying to get approval from, from boards of management. Um, and I think it's, it's a piece of the puzzle that there's some information out there, but not a lot of it and not a lot of local information. And I know that's in the works and I'm really excited to, to yeah. hear results. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that ties exactly into what we talked about. Like people have different motivations for wanting to control invasive species and we have to have research backed justifications that's going to reach all those people. And yeah, we have a couple, um, you probably know about the project in um, with Shime Thomas and Gretchen Hansen looking at AIS impacts on lakeshore property values. And then Lucia Levers and Amit Pradhananga are also working on valuation of carp removal. So, yep, there's much more to be done, but it's definitely on our radar. Who is next? Josh, you're unmuted. Are you ready to share? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. I guess I would have to say, so just looking at carp management, you know, attacking the life history of these other uh, aquatic invasive species um, like zebra mussels, knowing some of the, the triggers in order to get, um, you know, suppressed populations um, and just some of these other plant communities that are more resilient, you know, just more, you know, data and research and tools. I mean, it's uh, some of these newer invasive species are really, you know, they're really tough. We don't really understand a lot of it. Um, and that's where research is important. So, yeah. Thank you. General kind of vague answer, but that's what I. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Patrick? What's your burning question? I think one of the, the, the biggest knowledge gaps to understand. Um, you know, is we do a lot of stuff on the prevention side and would be nice to understand, you know, we have the Western states where it's really hard for invasives to move around with their pointed, you know, access points. Um, I think, you know, before they get here, um, I think we need to understand what if we were to monitor our state better? What if we were to mandate certain things. So I think one of the biggest things that, that I see is, uh, you know, what would a model say if we were to stop every boat coming into Minnesota through a checkpoint at the major arteries? Would it, you know, so if there was some sort of a, a study that could be done before they get here, we wouldn't have to be managing them. Um, and so you know, rather than say, let's go shut down our state and make this happen, maybe we could try to figure out what would the impacts be? Would we be better off, you know, stopping everything that's coming in and, and checking it? Or maybe it might not, it might be a mute point because there's so many back ways around the checkpoints. Uh, so I think, you know, one of the, the, the biggest, you know, things that is challenging is, how do we stop them from getting here first? Can we research better ways to stop these things from coming? Yeah, yeah. And, and trying to understand the motivations of why people seem to go to such extreme lengths to avoid a boat inspector or a decon station when it's it's low pressure, we're doing the work for you. It's it's yeah, I know a lot of people are looking into that, but that is also a big problem. Yeah. Well, those are great, great suggestions. I think we'll wrap up here. Um, hope, hopefully everybody noticed that we, um, Corey put a link to the research needs assessment survey. Take the survey if you haven't already. If you've already taken it, share it with all your friends and coworkers. It closes tomorrow. Um, thank you panelists. That was really fantastic. Um, really loved hearing about your work. Thank you for your support of MACERC. 
and next year, year after, hopefully we'll see you in person. Thanks everybody for joining and hope to see you at the happy hour. Bye everybody. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, thanks.